Genesis chapter 1, and I'm going to read 26 to 28. Our topic this morning and this afternoon is called Family Economics and Dominion. Family Economics and Dominion. And we'll be interacting with the Proverbs as well. But let me read Genesis first. A very important topic. A neglected topic, but important. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them, plural, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And then here's a few other passages. You don't have to turn to them. Just listen carefully. Exodus 20, verse 9. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. Yes, we have the Sabbath. Yes, we are to obey the Sabbath, but yes, we are to work six days a week. Proverbs 14, 23. In all their labor there is profit, but idle chatter leads only to poverty. Proverbs 22, 29. Do you see a man who excels in his work? He shall stand before kings. He will not stand before unknown, or as the old King James, or obscure men. In the creation account, we see some crucial things related to why we are here and our purpose in life, especially as Christians. Man was created in the image of God, and it's repeated twice. Man is created in the image of God to fulfill the creation mandate. And it's also called, the Dutch like to call it the cultural mandate. And theonomists like to call it the dominion mandate, but it's all the same thing. The creation mandate, the cultural mandate, the, the dominion mandate. There was to be a progressive subduing of the earth for God's glory. That's why man was created. He was created to work, to subdue the earth. And of course, Adam is given the task of naming all the animals, and what does that involve? Well, in the Hebraistic sense of naming something, you're identifying it according to its nature. So Adam was given a scientific task, a task of identifying and naming the creatures, studying them, and giving them a name appropriate to that creature. This, of course, was to be done through families. An intelligent, hard work, six days a week. Okay, God didn't create Adam in paradise and Eve in paradise so they could lounge around and lay in the sun and drink beer. They were created to work. Now, there's a time for relaxation, but we are to work six days a week. Before we look at implications and applications, let us consider some important aspects of this creation account. They kind of form the background. First, Twice we are told that man was made in God's image. Obviously, Moses writing this by divine inspiration is emphasizing this point. Both times, the fact that man is made in God's image precedes the dominion mandate. Now, why is man's nature before the fall emphasized? Before the dominion mandate, or the cultural mandate, or the creation mandate. Well, before the fall, we know some things about man before the fall by studying the rest of Scripture. Man was created with the law in his heart, with innate righteousness and holiness. Man was a righteous being, a holy being. He had the law, the moral law, written upon his conscience, on his heart. Man was to use his reason intellect and will to work in an intelligent, God-glorifying manner. Okay, what does man have that animals don't have? Well, we have the use of reason. And we have detailed language, communication. Animals communicate, they have language, but it's very simple and it's not anything like man's. 
progress, blessing, and prosperity was to come not simply through work, for the sake of work, but work that's done in an intelligent, moral, God-glorifying manner. Adam and Eve were to have families, was that were to have a family and work to please God. The love and service to God is what made work meaningful and in the long run, useful to society. Remember what Jesus said? He's talking about wealth. Seek first the things of the kingdom of God. Place God first. Place the gospel first. Place Christ first. And then all these other things, these material things that people have a tendency to worry about, they'll be added unto you. God first. Christ first. The word of God first. Because of the entrance of sin and depravity into the world, work is no longer seen in its proper biblical perspective. Men live not to glorify God, but self. The goal of unregenerate men from the beginning is no longer the glorification of God through work, through science, through technology, through service to others, but the glorification of man. That's what secular humanism is all about. And it's a religion. Secular humanism is a religion. They don't worship God, they worship man. And they place man above all things. And we see what it leads to. It leads to complete degradation and chaos. Sinful men still have an innate desire for dominion. It's part of the fabric of who we are. But not in terms of God's law and service to God, but rather service to self. They want to exalt self. They want to glorify self. They want dominion on their own terms. And thus they sought glorification through statism and the Tower of Babel instead of through faith in Christ and raising up a godly seed. Statism, the, the idea of the Molech state or the Messianic state, the idea of the state as savior of mankind, the state replacing the obligations of the family, the covenant family, the state replacing the obligations of the church, the messianic state is the natural result of total depravity and sin. It's not an accident that men who run from God run to statism. Thus, the modern generation of Americans who have cast off most of the remaining influences of Christianity are called the me generation. The hedonistic, self-centered generation. Eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Tune in, drop out, turn on. The me generation. The selfish generation. The hedonistic generation. They want wealth and prosperity and blessing apart from hard work. Apart from honest work. I watched a documentary about the hippies in San Francisco. This is the uh, 50th anniversary of the, sum, the, the so-called Summer of Love. It ought to be called the Summer of Sin in uh, San Francisco, Haight-Ashbury District. And there was a group called the Diggers. There was, there was a group of hippies, and they wanted people to not have to work. One of the things was drop out. And the reason the hippies rose up was because the previous generation had cast off the Bible and cast off biblical inspiration and the doctrine that the Bible is the final authority for secular humanism. So work no longer had any meaning. Work apart from God does not have any meaning. It's kind of useless. It's just basically a necessity so you can get something to eat. And so what they did is, is they didn't want to work. So the diggers offered free food, free housing. But they were dependent on charity. They were dependent on people who did work. You can't get away from the idea of work. They often turn to statism. It's not an accident. All those old hippies, are, they're now a bunch of statists. They're now a bunch of left-wing lunatics ruining the United States. For they desire the state to turn stones into bread through fiat currency and fractional reserve banking. They print money. You know, since the recession we had, what was it, 2008? They printed trillions of dollars of money. They just print it. 
They want the state to use their coercive powers to steal on their behalf so they can have supposedly free health care, free tuition, subsidized housing, food stamps, and so forth. That's the appeal that Bernie Sanders has to young people. Vote for me and I'll steal more effectively and more comprehensively on your behalf. Because rich people don't deserve what they've earned. Their money belongs to the state. They are thieves who want wealth without work. This narcissistic selfishness is rooted in the thinking of the beatniks and the hippies who define life not in terms of work, not in terms of accomplishments, or the development of capital in the Christian family, or life for God, but in terms of having fun. Through altering consciousness, sexual promiscuity, partying, and having a personal experience, whatever that may be. There's a reason, there's, there's a really obvious reason why the charismatic movement's the fastest growing uh, expression of what we call evangelicalism in the United States. Because it's not based on the word of God, it's based on having an experience. It's like taking drugs. Same thing with yoga. The biblical requirement of work was seen as slavery, as square, as caving into the establishment, the older generation. This revolution of hedonism and lawlessness could only take place because the previous two generations, going back to the 19, World War I, the 1920s, and the 1930s, when all the mainline denominations cast off the Word of God, they lost their faith in the Word of God, and thus work became meaningless or without a real purpose. If you're working for Christ, if you're working for God, if, you're, if your life has meaning, if you're building a family to serve God into the future after you're dead, your life has meaning. Work has meaning. Building capital has meaning. But without it, it doesn't. With all this in mind, we must never forget that work progress and genuine God-glorifying dominion after the fall is always connected to faith in Jesus Christ and his perfect redemption. The dominion mandate, the cultural mandate... The creation mandate didn't disappear, but now it's salvific in orientation. It can only be achieved by first submitting to Christ, by believing in him, by becoming a Christian. And this is the foundation of what Max Weber called the Protestant work ethic. Here's a secular guy, a German, a brilliant guy, who studied economics, who studied sociology and so forth, and saw that there was a unique difference between the Puritans and the Reformed people of Northern Europe and Romanists and pagans. He could see it. He called it the Protestant work ethic. Now, there was some progress during the era of the corrupt faith of Romanism, but not much. Human traditions and ecclesiocracy resulted in a form of statism and oppression. For example, the idea of the divine right of kings, where no matter what the king said or did, it was law and it was good. And that's simply statism. And the papacy is God ruling on earth. Not sola scriptura, not submitting to the word of God, but simply whatever the Pope says, ex cathedra, is law, whether it's based on the Bible or not. But with Protestantism, and especially the rise of the Reformed faith, came liberty and great, great economic and scientific progress and prosperity. Note, for example, Switzerland. During the Middle Ages, Switzerland was known as a great source of mercenaries. You want a bunch of thugs who are come and fight on your behalf for some cash? That's where you go. But in the 16th century, it adopted the Reformed faith, and people began to, began to live sanctified lives, lives based on the Word of God. They learned what the Bible had to say about work, about wealth, about glorifying God. And as a result, they went from almost a purely agrarian economy, very basic economy, to one of the most advanced, prosperous nations on earth. Now, they were not living in an area rich in iron, coal, and natural resources, but because of, but they, so they became great watchmake, watchmakers and technicians, and still Swiss watches are considered the best in the world. Even though they had few resources, they used their Christian intellect to serve God, and as a result, they prospered. 
Now you say, well, Hong Kong's prospering and Japan's prospering and Korea's prospering. Of course, South Korea is the most Christian country in the East. Well, they deliberately imitated the West. They deliberately imitated Christians. So, work is God's design for mankind. Man as God's image bearer was to develop a word worldwide, moral, meaningful, advanced culture that loved God, that served God, that lived for God. <clears throat> now our task is to work for a worldwide Christian culture because the cultural mandate, the dominion mandate, the creation mandate is only fulfilled through Christ, the second Adam. For the Christian, the goal is not simply to generate wealth and prosperity, but to do so for the sake of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of grace. Generally speaking, pagan and atheistic cultures do not generate financial prosperity. Look at Africa. Look at the ghetto. But we do have the modern phenomena of pagan nations imitating the free market capitalism that came out of Western Christendom. The heathen are imitating certain liberties that came from Protestant Christianity. And when you imitate principles that are in the Bible, you prosper. You may be inconsistent with your world and life view, because the Chinese, for example, are a bunch of atheists. You may be totally inconsistent with your world and life view, but if you follow biblical principles, you will prosper. Another thing to keep in mind about work is that an aspect of the curve an aspect of the curse is that work after the fall is more difficult and can be very hard. Remember what God said to Adam regarding the curse. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. Now, any of you who have gardened know that weeds grow very quickly. You don't even have to plant weeds. They just grow everywhere. And they're extremely vigorous. And they grow like crazy. And you can spray them and kill them and pull them. And they, they come back and they come back. After the fall, things become much more difficult for man. Before the fall, work was much easier and more pleasing. After the fall, work can be drudgery, difficult, hard. And often work today does not seem rewarding because of the effects of sin. Consequently, one of the purposes of the cultural mandate or the dominion mandate, which can now uh, only be fulfilled through Christ's redemption, is to work to alleviate the effects of the fall the curse, as best we can, both morally through preaching the gospel and teaching the whole counsel of God, especially Christian ethics. And if you go to nations that have been strongly influenced by Christianity, you see a law-abiding society where things function quite well. If you go to nations where that is not the case, you go to hell holes where it's very dangerous and you don't go out at night and it's extremely bad. These two, <clears throat> must be connected. Otherwise, liberty will be denied and replaced with statism. So you have to have the preaching of the gospel. You have to have the teaching of the whole counsel of God. You have to have Christian sanctification. Capitalism, what's called free market capitalism, without Christian ethics, slides very easily into corporatism, into fraud, into lying, into conniving, into going to the government to use coercion on your behalf. You have to have free market capitalism coupled with biblical law or it will be a disaster. Free market capitalism, which has brought great economic benefits to mankind, can only function properly under biblical law. Without a commitment to Christ and the love to neighbor, which is explicated in God's moral law, fraud, deception, theft, and companies aligned with the state to remove competition will result. The state will become messianic in its claims and will progressively choke out the freedoms that have come from biblical Protestantism. And we're living in an era uh, whenever the Democrats get in power, more regulations, more statism, more statism. The Republicans might slow it down a little bit, but they're not a whole lot better than the Democrats. The state becomes an idol. And the family's biblical role and dominion is progressively diminished. Churches are also forced out of the charitable activities and, of course, education. 
There's a really good book written by George Grant, and I forgot what it's called, but he documents how in the, uh, primarily I think it would be the 1930s, probably began earlier around World War I, but when the state discovered that they could buy votes through welfare programs, all the Christian charities were basically run out of business. They were destroyed and regulated out of business because the state wanted to buy votes. Christians used to run hospitals. Christians used to run orphanages. Christians used to run education centers. Christians used to take care of the poor. It was all run privately and it was all done way better than the state ever done it, did it, has done it. And they, they were driven out of business by the state because the state wants to buy votes. So the state will become messianic in its claims and progressively choke out the freedoms that, we, that have come from biblical Protestantism. The state becomes an idol and the family's biblical role and dominion is diminished. Because of the Protestant work ethic and their commitment to a biblical worldview, many effects of the fall have been mitigated. Food production has exploded. Now, if you're older, you remember books were written in the 1960s that said by the year 2000, people, we'd, there'd be starvation all over the world. Things would be terrible. Well, we're producing tons of food, way more food than they ever expected because of science and technology applied to food production. Food production has exploded. Medical treatments have greatly improved. People work less hours under less harsh conditions. I'm talking about Western nations and are living much longer, much, much longer. If you live to be 60 years old before World War I, that's not too bad. Now, if you die before you're 77, that's considered tragedy. The scourge of diseases such as polio, typhoid fever, tuberculosis, smallpox, and so forth is no longer killing hundreds of thousands of children. You, any of you who've read books about the Puritans and you read, well, they had 12 children, but six of them died before they were five years old. Very common. Very, very common. And imagine the pain and anguish that went with that. But if our society, which is living on the prosperity and Christian capital laid down by a Christian culture, totally abandons Christ and runs into state worship or the worship of Molech, God will bring curses upon it that are almost unimaginable. We see the rise of Islam and attacking the West. We see bacteria now that are unaffected by antibiotics. Just to give you a foretaste. Of course, there's the AIDS epidemic. All that has to do is mutate again and where it can't be treated, and that'll be, uh, that'll be fun for people. Evil men who live for sinful pleasures, who hate God and are rebellion against him, cannot make life better in the long run. They can't. They just can't do it. They will only make us slaves to an out-of-control Molech state. Thus, we see that we were created in God's image to have dominion, in a God-honoring, God-glorifying manner. Once again, since the fall, this can only be done through Jesus Christ and his redemption. Without Christ and sanctification, society moves either towards anarchy or statism. And you see that throughout history. When you have the rise of anarchy, what happens is it's like Germany right before Hitler. Things get so bad and things are so dangerous in the streets that they want an all-powerful state to squash it. And so you get a Napoleon, or you get a Hitler. Consequently, we must walk, excuse me, we must work for each covenantal institution, the family, the church, and the state, to submit to Christ and his law word. Second, note that the dominion mandate, or the cultural mandate, is given to a married couple, a family, and not simply to one individual. And the text emphasizes that. He created Adam, and then God makes it very clear, Adam and Eve. And the word them is used. The dominion mandate applies to both Adam and Eve. Yes, Adam's the covenant head, but it applies to wives as well. This is done for a few reasons. One reason is that dominion and cultural continuity is dependent on having children, and the only, only lawful non-sinful manner of propagating mankind is heterosexual, monogamous marriage. That's the only God-ordained lawful way of having children. 
If we look at the command to be fruitful and multiply in conjunction with the other teachings of Scripture about the family, we see a number of crucial teachings about economics and dominion. God is not simply interested in there being a lot of people, human beings walking around the earth. What he wants is us to raise up a godly seed. Here's what David says. And this is uh, Psalm 37, 25 to 29. I have been young and now am old. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken nor his descendants begging bread. He is merciful and, le and lends, and his descendants are blessed. Depart from evil and do good, and dwell forevermore. For the Lord loves justice and does not forsake his saints. They are preserved forever, but the descendants of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell in it forever. So we have an explicit connection between prosperity and obedience to the moral law of God. And there's other psalms I could have quoted to talk about the saints inheriting the wealth of the wicked. We're going to inherit the earth, not the atheists, not the secular humanists. They're going to be cast in a lake of fire. And then here's Malachi 2.13 to 15. And he's condemning, God's condemning the people who, uh, especially the men who are getting rid of their wives. Uh, here's what it says. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and crying. So he does not regard the offering anymore, nor to receive it with goodwill from your hands. Yet you say, for what reason? Okay, God's not answering their prayers. Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth, with whom you have dealt treacherously. Yet she is your wife by covenant. But did he not make them one, having a remnant of the Spirit? And why one? He seeks godly offspring. Therefore, take heed to your spirit and let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. It's a very familiar theme in history. Men were getting older. And what were they doing? They were getting rid of their wives who were older too and replacing them with younger wives who were prettier. And God was really upset about it. And he was judging them. And they were suffering. Although the dominion mandate was originally given to a family, the fall into sin has resulted in certain changes or modifications because now godly dominion can only come through faith in Christ and submission to his law word. Thus, let's keep in mind, the church is the primary institution for godly dominion. And the Great Commission, which is salva uh, the salvific continuation of the cultural mandate, is given to church officers. Dominion spreads through the preaching of the gospel and the sacraments. They are responsible for preaching the gospel, baptizing and discipling the nations. The, le the leavening of the world with the kingdom of Christ is dependent upon the preaching of the gospel. God's grace. Now keep in mind that if the first family had not sinned, the covenant institutions of the state and the church, at least as we know them today, would not have been, uh, would have been unnecessary. If there's no sin, you don't need a police force. If there's no sin, you don't need judges. You don't need a state involved. And if there's no sin, you don't need the gospel being preached by preachers, do you? Well, having noted the crucial role of the church in fulfilling the dominion mandate, we must keep in mind that Christian families are still crucial in achieving godly dominion. Okay, I want to make it perfectly clear I'm not denigrating the church in any way. The church is the primary institution of dominion, but I, we want to look at the church in this, in the, the family in the, its proper context. Families are still crucial in achieving godly dominion, and there are a number of reasons why this is true. Number one, the family is the nursery of both the church and the state. God has always dealt with families covenantally. The children of believers are members of God's covenant. They're members of the church. God wants believers to think in terms of the future, to think generationally. You see this especially in the Psalms, where in, in the law of God, there's this emphasis on discipling your children, raising them up to follow Christ, to follow God. The Christian discipline and self-government taught in the home will have a tremendous impact 
on the future of both the church and society. Do you read the Old Testament history of Israel? What is it? Declension revival, declension revival. You'll have somebody who's a pretty solid Christian and their kids grow up and they're pagans. Well, we don't want that to happen. And the way to try to not have that happen is to be diligent. Secular humanists and statists are aware of the importance of controlling children. Thus, state schools are adept at making children good citizens of the state. One of the first things Hitler did when he came to power, they established the Hitler Youth. All you young boys were, it was like the Boy Scouts, except it worshipped Hitler. And they also had a program for women as well, young girls as well. Children are taught to look to the Messianic state as savior, as lord of society. Whoever controls the children controls the future. Communists know this, Nazis know it, statists know it, secular humanists and Democrats today know it. Why do you think Democrats are so opposed to freedom of choice and schooling for young children? Because they want them in the public school being brainwashed with status nonsense and immorality. For worldwide dominion to occur, it must e extend and expand into the future. Okay, so the dominion mandate is given to a family, and the family is commanded to have children to go into the future. And then number two, private property, and Christians often don't think about this, but private property, economic activity, and scientific progress rests not with the church or the state, but with the family. The church has the means of grace, the keys of the kingdom. The state bears the sword of justice. But neither is responsible for direct economic or scientific progress. Now, there were monks in the Middle Ages who made wine and made products to sell to support their monasteries, but that's not the church's job. It's really not economic. The church's job is to preach the gospel and administer biblical justice and the sacraments. The church may own meeting places and theological schools, but it is not an economic or scientific organization. The state, being responsible for civil defense, has a scientific and e economic interest in weapon systems and military training institutes. So if there's going to be, a, let's say, a, a, a school on technology on developing better planes or, or whatever, the state has an interest in that. But the state has no biblical mandate to engage in economic activity and own property outside of the limited parameters of civil justice and defense. I don't have a problem with the government spending, the civil government spending money on the military and on developing advanced weapon systems. That's their job. Their job is not writing welfare checks and giving out food stamps and controlling health care. That's not their job, according to Scripture. I know a lot of Christians disagree with me, but they're statists and they're not following scripture, they're following secular humanism. The earth is indeed the Lord's, as it's all dominion. But God has chosen to have dominion over, uh, given the dominion over the earth to man, subject to his law word. And property is the central aspect of that dominion. The absolute and transcendental title of the property belongs to Jehovah. It is the Lord's, it is God's. The present and historical title to property is man's. The ownership of property does not leave this world when it is denied to man. It is simply transferred to the state. That is why property taxes are so immoral. Because it's an implicit recognition that the state owns all property and not God. God owns the property, not the state. Now families are to diligently train their children for godly dominion into the future. The next generation of businessmen, ministers, elders, scientists, farmers, civil leaders, judges must be taught self-control and discipline, biblical discipline, and how to apply the word of God to all areas of life. Remember Malachi. You're shafting the wife of your youth. And I designed marriage for this purpose, for you to have godly children, a godly seed to raise them up. That's why you get married. Not so you can have a poodle and go to the beach. Go to California and they have beaches for dogs and it's all these young yuppies who never, got, they, they didn't get married, they don't have any children, but they have lots of pets. Those children who apostatize from the faith must be disinherited as Christ-denying covenant breakers. 
The biblical economic goal is to increase the dominion of Christians, not families as such. The institutional focus is on the kingdom rather than the family, the kingdom of God. Thus, parents should normally leave their wealth to believing children and only believing children, assuming that the children are economically competent and faithful to the external requirements of the covenant. That's kind of obvious. If they are not, then parents should consider setting up trusts governed by competent church members if they don't have any faithful children or just give it all to the church. The church primarily consists of and is supported by families. While the family carries on dominion through labor, technology, and science, etc., the family's priority in life is the local church in serving Christ, not economic expansion or endeavor. The son who is apostatized, who has a PhD in engineering, should be disinherited and his portion given to the son who is a faithful believer, yet may be a plumber or an electrician. If all the children have apostatized, the money should go to the church and not to unbelievers. The idea of a Christian parent giving money to a heathen child or an unfaithful child is insane. Spiritual brotherhood always takes priority over unbelieving blood brotherhood. Furthermore, funding and attending a true reformed church should take priority over one's economic career. Okay, it used to be a couple hundred years ago that everybody's priority was, I want to live where there's a good church. That's gone now. Now the priority is, I want to live where I can make the most money, and then I'll go to whatever church happens to be in that area, even if it's terrible or junky. And it's taught in reform circles today, and this, this is taught in the OPC, the PCA, and everybody teaches this. Well, where, you just attend the church in your area, even if it's a Baptist Arminian church, just go there. That's completely insanity. Those people are heretics. They have no business preaching. You have to be willing. The covenanters were great about this in the 1800s and 1700s. You move where there's a good church. You support a good church. You don't support a crummy church that's denying the regular principle and that's violating the covenants. <clears throat> and Christian families have a responsibility to support the church through church membership, regular attendance, cheerful giving, etc. Since the family is the training institute of the next generation, the primary property owner of society and the spearhead of economic growth and science, the head of the Christian household must take seriously his role as the leader in family worship, Bible training, doctrinal instruction, and prayer. Parents are also responsible for the children's economic and intellectual training as well. And sadly, it is common for evangelicals to send their children to anti-Christian state schools and let them watch pagan nonsense on TV for several hours a day. And this is not only unbiblical, but amounts to a generational spiritual suicide. According to Gallup, according to studies, 75%, I think it's around 75% of evangelical children are completely apostate by the age of 22. A large percentage go apostate in high school because they're going to a non-Christian pagan high school. And then if they're not apostate by high school, the end of high school, they a lot more are apostate totally by the end of college. It is one of the main reasons that evangelicalism is so impotent and saltless in our day. God's word is to be learned and integrated into every area of life throughout the day, every day. And you can't do that with secular, pagan, Molech, statist, state school education. The public school system is anti-Christ. It is anti-Christian. It is a, a training center for secular humanism in the Democratic Party, which is satanic to the very core. Here's what God says. Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign in your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 9. Now, how can you do that if your kids are in public school all day? In public school, 
pro-Islam, pro-atheism. And, you know, it's against the law to pray in Jesus' name at a public school. It's against the law to read your Bible at a public school, out loud to others. It's against the law to talk about Christ in a public school. Well, then what is it? It's an anti-Christian school. It is an anti-Christ school. It is satanic to the core. And of course, you add all the other things that they're teaching relativist ethics. They're teaching a worship of the state. They're teaching sodomite rights. They're teaching that the family is not defined as a heterosexual a monogamous family, that the family, it means whatever you want it to mean, whether it's two sodomites or two lesbians or whatever. Although this passage addresses all believers, it especially speaks to Christian parents. Parents who are new to the faith must first diligently begin with themselves and then earnestly, frequently, and consistently teach their family. What a dreadful, foolish, and disobedient thing it is for parents to be slothful and neglectful in such an important God-given task. What a sad day it will be in the day of judgment for those parents who delegated the responsibility of godly dominion through child-rearing to Hollywood and the pagan state. Well, you know, I wanted to teach them about Christ, but, you know, I, you know I'm paying for public school anyway through my property taxes. I might as well send them and... You know, that frees up more money so I can work and have more money so I can get a Corvette. Well, your Corvette's going to rust away someday and you're going to send your children to hell because you're selfish and materialistic and act like a pagan. Here's what Thomas Manton says, and this is from the, uh, the thing in the Westminster Standards, that, that little intro. If there be any compassion to the souls of those under your care, if there be any of you being found faithful in the day of Christ, if any respect to future generations, labor... To sow these seeds of knowledge, which may grow up in after times. And he's talking about the Westminster Standards. Use them. Use them to train your children. Make them read them. So we have seen that God wants a godly seed to spread throughout the earth. And that families form the nursery of both the church and the state. While there is clearly a reciprocal relationship between Christian families and the church, for example, all parents are under the authority and oversight of the session, nevertheless, parents must do their job faithfully for the church to prosper generationally or into the future. And some of the applications and implications of biblical teaching are as follows. We'll look at some applications and implications. But you say, well, why are, why are churches so bad? Well, People, church members choose the pastor. And if they choose some unbiblical guy who's up there cracking jokes and teaching a bunch of garbage, it's because the families are bad. There's a reciprocal relationship. If the families have their act together, the church will have their act together. Bad families are attracted to bad churches. Bad churches produce bad families. So there's a reciprocal relationship. And of course, bad churches and bad families produce a wicked state. Well, first, the requirement to work is connected to our image before the fall and by implication, the restored image by Christ in two, true knowledge and righteousness. Paul uses that in, in Ephesians. Okay, the image of God and man is damaged seriously by the fall. It's restored in principle fully through Christ. This means that we are to use our minds effectively and that our minds must always be in subjection to Christ and his law word. As Christians who want to have an impact for the kingdom of God and Christian culture into the future, we want to emphasize spiritual and intellectual training or education. Now, a ditch digger has a lawful calling, but will not have much of an impact on culture, unless, of course, he raises up a large family of solid Christians. Christians should put an emphasis on a truly Christian education. We should be intellectual in the good sense of the term. That is, everything must be integrated into the Christian world and life view, especially our vocation. And of course, we must be very holy. Our Christian education must affect our behavior. When Christians are Im act like imbeciles and are ignorant of all doctrine, of basic doctrines, they're ignorant of Christian ethics and they're ignorant of a Christian world and life view, it's, they're, they're an embarrassment. And they, how can they take dominion? 
How can they advance the kingdom of God when, when they don't have their act together at all? We want to be good witnesses for Christ, so we must be able to defend the faith intellectually in the modern world. Of course, we're called to do that in Peter. Be ready to give an answer to anybody. To be a faithful witness, we must also behave as solid Christians. You know, Christians say, hey, we've got the answer. And they're getting divorced and they're committing adultery and they're doing all kinds of crazy things. People are going to go, well, you don't want to listen to those guys. The modern evangelical paradigm, where children are placed in state schools to be indoctrinated in statism, socialism, racism, perverse sexuality, <clears throat> as well as anti-Christian and anti-family propaganda, has been an unmitigated disaster. After spending all week under this teaching and the discipleship of satanic secular humanists, the church attempts to counteract all the Satanism with 45 minutes of shallow, gimmicky, mediocre, and usually unbiblical Sunday school lessons. So they're in school all day, you know, eight to three, whatever it is, all day, five days a week, and you're going to counteract that with some silly, goofy Sunday school program taught by somebody who's totally incompetent. And then you wonder why 75% of your kids go back to the world. The fact that many evangelicals think like pagans and act like pagans and their children, about 75%, go back to the side of Satan in the world should not surprise us. God wants you to raise up a godly seed. God wants you to extend Christian dominion into the future. And this ought to affect the way you think about child rearing. It ought to affect the way you think about economics. In conjunction with a vigorous, consistently reformed Christian education needs to be a careful consideration of one's vocation or calling. As children reach adulthood, one must keep in mind that certain jobs require advanced or specialized education. Such education can be expensive and time-consuming. Without training, one's ability to advance economically is often stunted, and people are left in a low-paying, dead-end job. So this is important. Therefore, investing and training can be a very wise, beneficial thing. Now, obviously, there are jobs that are immoral. You know, you, you don't want to be a, an abortion doctor. You don't want to be a nurse in an abortion clinic. You don't want to be uh, one of these lawyers who works to uh, advance racism, like the Southern uh, Poverty Law Center, which advances uh, Satanism and liberalism and racism in the name of fighting racism. Um, you don't want to do that. But there are many good jobs, but they require an education. But before this is done to any great extent, one must seek to find one's calling or vocation. And it's not, not easy for everybody. This was emphasized in the past, especially among Reformed or Puritan thinkers. You know, and they, they tried to get it figured out quite young. People died earlier back then, so they tried to get it figured out by the time they were 14 or so. Pick a vocation. What's your vocation going to be? What are you going to do in life? So you want to think about that. You want to pray about that. You want to meditate about that if you're young. What is my vocation or calling in life? This was emphasized in the past, especially among Reformed and Puritan thinkers. Therefore, every man should seek out a lawful, helpful vocation that God has especially equipped him for. Then they should study and prepare themselves to be proficient in that calling. Travel, pleasures, leisure, and such must be put on hold so one can sort, those things, uh, sort these things out and prepare to have a family. You see what I'm saying here? As a Christian, your life has meaning. Your life has a direction. Your life has a purpose. We're not here to party and have a good time. We're here to have a family to raise up a godly seed. We're here to prosper economically to support that godly seed and extend dominion into the future. The dominion mandate was given to a family, and a family must be supported, and there must be a roof over one's head. Paul says, I forgot to write it down. It's 1 Timothy 5 somewhere. If anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel or an unbeliever. The family is God's ordained education and training center, 
as well as the chief welfare agency in existence, not the state. The state has no role in such things. And the church has a secondary role in charity when families are unable or unwilling to help. Paul makes that very clear. If they've got relatives, let them take care of it. If they don't have any relatives, if she's truly a widow indeed and has no one to help her at all, then help her out. He says nothing about the state. The Old Testament says nothing about the state getting involved. I know there's a lot of Presbyterians, especially in Scotland, who love statism, but they don't get that from the Bible. They're just simply following the modern Weltanschauung, the modern worldview of paganism. All of this requires money, capital, and prosperity. The firstborn son, if faithful to God, was to receive a larger proportion of the inheritance with the expectation that he would care for his parents when they were old and feeble. The rise of statism has trained Americans to put their parents in old folks' homes where they are lonely, drugged up to the max, and they're set in front of a television set. That's what they're taught. That's what they're trained. And old people expect that because they've been taught that too. They accept the situation, as does the churches by and large, because our society has been indoctrinated in statism. The state has taken over much of the responsibilities of the family and the church because it is messianic in orientation and has learned to purchase voter loyalty through programs. That's what the Democrats are all about. Vote for us, we'll print more money for you, and we'll steal more money for you. And that's satanic. Christians ought not to be getting food stamps or welfare or any of that stuff. If you are, you're a thief. Now, we're going to take a little break, and we're going to come back. We've got a lot more to say about uh, families and economics. Um, we're going to look at our next point, which God expects us to have large families and to train them in the faith. Okay, we are to think generationally. But let's take a little break. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this amazing teaching. Our life has meaning. Our life has purpose in Christ. And you've chosen to work through families. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us to be faithful and effective in this area. And you'd teach us. Put these things in our heart. That we would learn about Christian economics. That we would learn about how to prosper biblically so we can help the church grow, so that we can put the kingdom of God first in life, and so that we would have a godly seed that extends into the future and can carry on the work that we've begun. In Jesus' name, amen.